Some of us have extended a, a legit, authentic invitation to the Holy Spirit of God to come and do what only He can do. But as we've been sharing on Wednesday nights, some of us don't want that. Some of us don't want to do what He does. Someone, some people don't want to hear what He has to say. say Holy Spirit come you don't necessarily say come into the room you say point to your chest you say come right here point to your head this is where I want you you gotta be careful what you ask for because sometimes Jesus would he would preach boldly and sometimes even his own disciples like you are would walk away and say, that was a difficult message. Who can accept this? That's what's coming at you tonight, loved ones. But So let's just get back to this. Holy Spirit, come. Help us, Lord, to submit to the authority of your word. Break down walls of rebellion now. Take down Jericho that's around our hearts right now. And help us to receive your perfect and beautiful and life-giving word. tonight, Lord, we want to know you better. To know you is to know life eternal. And that's what we desire. Everyone in this room desires that your kingdom would grow, Lord. I know it. Loved ones, the best gift you could give this king of yours that you love to give him your heart, to give him your mind right now so that his kingdom can grow in you right now. Just open it up. Open it up. God desires to do a tremendous work in you and then to do a tremendous work through you. Come to class, loved ones. Come to class and sit at his feet learn. Lord, we come to you and we, and we bow before you right now. We acknowledge that you are King and Lord and that we are not. Lord, we know that your word is powerful. We know that your word is true. So therefore, we submit ourselves to it now. Not just those that would worship you with our mouths and say that but whose hearts are far away, but hearts who are close, sitting down right now at your feet with ears to hear what you have to say to us. Lord, help us not to be just hearers, but to be doers of what we hear tonight. So good to see you all here tonight, and I am good to see you there, Mr. Greg. How's everybody? Good. Yeah, doing good. Awesome. Um, we're going to continue our uh, series tonight in studying the book of uh, Philemon. I want to welcome uh, not just those of us that are in the room. Uh, although I'm happy to see you all, but I uh, also want to welcome those that are going to watch us on Facebook Live and uh, don't know exactly who you are, but I do want to extend a uh, warm welcome to 
Dave and Judy Strickland from up in South Carolina. I know, yeah. And their family members as well. Um, <coughs> just to kind of give you an update on, on their progress up there, you know, they were, a, they were and are a precious part of our family. And, you know, on occasion, David does stop by and visit with us. Uh, but they left, it was almost eight months ago, it seems like yesterday, right? But they left about eight months ago, and, and they knew I was kind of going to be bummed out when they told me that they were leaving, and I was, but they said because of the ministry here at this church that they have finally feel inspired, and, and God has given them a ministry and an extension of this place, but that they were going to buy this property up in South Carolina, and they were going to build a pastor's retreat where guys could go <coughs> and find some rest that they need. And so they're, they bought this <clears throat> this land, and uh, and there's a there's two houses on it, and there's a fishing lake right there. Sounds like I want to move right now. And they're having a chapel built right there on the property where people can come up and just get away and spend some one-on-one quiet time with the Lord, kind of like what we do on Monday nights. And so they wanted to create that type of environment for people to go to. So super, super excited to tell you that their chapel was built off property and then delivered to the property just a couple of days ago. So it's been dropped. And so now David's going to, yeah, it's really exciting. And now David's going to build out the rest of it with the electricity. And, and I don't know what's going on with this thing. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, so progress is being made. And so we're super, super excited uh, for them. Um, so anyway, excited to, uh, to share God's word with you. Uh, if you want to turn in your Bibles to the book of Philemon, that's a good pl- place to be. You may never have heard of that book before. Uh, some people call it Philemon, some people call it Philemon. We're a non-denominational church and we don't fight over things that, that God's not clear about. And how many people were alive when Philemon or Philemon was alive? None of you, right? Neither was I. And so we're just going to call him Phil because that's his name because I have a microphone and you don't. And so <clears throat> we're going to call him Phil. So turn to the book of Phil. It's right there before the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is a mountaintop in scripture and, and Philemon is which I call him, but Phil he, he's not a mountaintop, although uh, the, the stuff inside the book is awesome, and it is a, uh, thank you so much, and it is a, uh, an Everest of, of, of truth, and so we're going to study that for a while. I don't know how long we're going to be there, but last week we kind of jumped into, into uh, that book, and we talked about uh, engaging with people, right? So you're supposed to speak up. You're not supposed to just be quiet all the time. God teaches you some things so you can teach other people, and we don't want to let our brothers and sisters in Christ get close to the cliff, so close that, that they fall off and hurt themselves, and you want to speak into their life when they're getting ready to fall off that cliff, don't we? And we talked about a, a, a parenting verse that talks about that if you hate your child, you wouldn't discipline them. But if you love your child, you would discipline them diligently, which means frequently, right? You pay attention. You engage with someone that you really love. You don't just let them fall off into the cliff and say, oh, well, no, you say something when you love them. And so Paul's speaking up, and he's speaking boldly to his friend. And so we, we're, 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 we're not really concerned with what other people think about what a Christian is. We're concerned with what the Bible teaches us. And that was one of the things that we learned right out of the gate before we talked about the particulars of the book where Paul teaches what a Christian should be. We just saw modeled in Paul someone who would speak up and speak into the life of someone that they care for, another brother in Christ. And so we're supposed to do the same. And of course, in this book, we do see Paul speak to this guy and tell him what a real Christian should look like, who who he or she should be, how they should live, not just based on what other people told him, but based on what God's word says and so he does that, but he also models awesome Christ-like character in, in actually engaging this guy, you know. And so uh, sometimes we see in this book uh, details of what a Christian should be as Paul teaches and exhorts the person. But also sometimes we just see in the process how Paul is ex- exemplifying what a Christian should be. And so we want to follow his lead. Remember Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And so we see the example of Paul here in this letter, and so we're examining that as well. And so uh, what we want to do is um, we want to really examine every single aspect of this book. Like we want to check out every single detail, and some of it's very, very difficult. Now, as I mentioned earlier in prayer about a difficult message, who can accept it? This one is a very difficult message. I was having a conversation, I believe, earlier this week with, and I don't know where Meredith, or Meredith's back there. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't remember. She'll, 
hopefully correct me if I'm wrong before the second service, but I think it was this week we were at home talking to Tanner and Nicole about uh, my experience back years ago um, at my mom's temple where I grew up in. You know, you guys know I'm Jewish, right? So I went to temple when I was a kid, and, and I went to temple at Sharon. I went back to visit a few years back, and uh, actually it's been about t- 10 years now. Time's flying. And so I went back there, and I'm visiting, and um, so the service comes to an end, and, and, and I'm sitting out in the lobby, and the, and the rabbi comes up to me, and he asked me, why, why wouldn't you come up to the stage when I called you to do one of these readings? So I told him, I said, well, I don't really, I don't know Hebrew, and I, and I don't agree with what you're doing here. And he was like shocked, you know. And he's like, what do you mean you don't agree with what I'm doing here? I said, well, let me just ask you this. I said, you know, these, um, you know, you guys know that you got a, a these Bibles are here, these blue ones, right? They're for you to read. They're not just like paperweights. They're actually for you to read. And uh, they got them in the temple too, but they're a little bit different. And so when I was there in the temple. I went and pulled out one of them pew Bibles, and I'm reading through it. And they don't do the New Testament, you know. They don't like Jesus. so. And um, But they got the Old Testament there, except that they don't have all of it. And I'm like looking through it, and I see like pieces of Isaiah and pieces of Ezekiel and pieces of Hosea. And I'm like, man, you don't even put in the whole Old Testament. Forget the Jesus stuff. You didn't even put in the whole Old Testament. So I asked him, I'm like, why don't you, why don't you use that? Why, why, why don't you use all of the Old Testament? And he's like, well, that's just what we use. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. How, 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 how is somebody supposed to make a quality decision for their eternity if you don't give them all the, all the information, right? Full disclosure makes for a better opportunity to make a better decision. So they don't give them the full thing. And so <coughs> I said, uh, all right, Rabbi, you read Isaiah 53, haven't you? He's like, yeah. I said, who are they talking about? Oh, well, they may be talking about Jesus, but, uh, but my mom's sitting right there, right? And she's listening to the rabbi say, well, he might be talking about Jesus. I thought she was going to die or kill him right there on the spot. Anyway, all, the, all that to say that if we're going to give them, if you're going to let people make a decision, it's got to be based on full disclosure. You've got to tell them everything. And if we're going to be, we talked about, you know, um, People in churches don't seem to change. You don't see any life change in them. Stay with me, guys. Listen. You don't see a lot of change in people. Why is it that people go to church all the time, but they don't seem to change? They're still the same guy that they were. They're still the same girl that they were when you met them a couple years back. And they're at church every single week, but why aren't they changing? Well, I think the reason, one of the reasons why they don't change is because a lot of times some of this stuff is dodged. We don't like to talk about everything. There's a lot of things. We, I was, I've been talking to Tanner. I love when Tanner's here. We get to talking a lot about the church. And we talked about, listen, and don't be freaking out when I tell you this, okay? About, you know, what are some of the things that we could do that maybe would cause the church to grow? And I'm not going back on preaching, you know, the full thing. But there's churches that do that. There's churches, good churches. Men and women that are good people, that have a good heart, but... Sometimes you get a little nervous and you might tweak what you do in order to fill the seats and get a little bit more money in the plate and maybe that's the way to do it. I don't think that that's the case. I think that's one way to do it. I don't think it's the right way to do it. And I don't want to be that church and I know you don't want to be that church. And so sometimes you teach things that you just don't want to teach. And just because I'm up here talking about it, that doesn't mean I like it any better than you like it, but I feel as though that I have to just preach what God's Word says. That's just the way it has to be because um, He says so. <laughs> and so we, we just want to study all that Paul would say to Philemon here and, and, and why he's doing it. And so we started last week by just, it's going to get hard here tonight, just telling you. And um, we preached last week about engaging and speaking up and don't be quiet. And love means you open your face and speak it. Faith comes from what? From seeing the word of God? See, all these people talk about, well, they're going to see my faith. No, 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 no. They're going to hear your faith, right? Faith doesn't come from seeing your faith. Faith comes from what? All God's people? Hearing, the right? Hearing the word. So we have to open up our mouths. And so... So that's what Paul's doing here. He's, he's opening up his mouth and he's speaking 
to someone that he loves, a brother in the Lord. He's not quiet. The guy didn't just get saved. Okay, he's good now. No, he sees something that's lacking, and he opens up his mouth. Now, what's really, really neat about this book is that Paul is writing to Philemon or Phil <coughs> with a very poorly disguised boldness. He's speaking boldly, and he's trying to disguise it with an epic failure. Look at verse 8, if you will. Look at verse 8. Uh, that's why I'm boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ, but it is the right, because it's the right thing to do. But because of our love, I'll prefer simply to ask you. Like, that's so not hidden, right? He comes right out and says, I'm, I'm asking you to please do this, but I'm really not. I'm telling you, you have to do this, right? And then look at verse 21 of the same book here, verse 21. What, is, what does he say here? He says, I am confident as I write this letter that you will do what I ask and even more. You'll be obedient to what I said, right? Here's the, here's the funny thing about this whole thing. Is that this dude's in jail. He's in jail. Let, 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 let me tell you about one. Of, I, I, you may know, but one of the things, that these dirt, here's a dirty little secret. My wife and I, every single day, she's got me on to this. <coughs> we go to Lake County Sheriff's Office on the, on the phone, and we look to see which one of you guys is in jail. <laughs> right? Because we want to know who we have to visit next. All too often we have to visit, but we do check to see who we know and love if they're in jail. And let's just, let's just can we just be honest in church for a second? When someone's in jail, if, if, do you, do you want to take advice from a jailbird? I mean, let's just be honest for a moment here, okay? Don't be high and holy. Just be honest here. If, 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 if someone's in jail, when you look up on the phone and you see this guy in jail for this or this lady in jail, is that someone that you want as a life coach, right? That's not who you would choose. And, this, and Paul is in jail writing advice and demanding this. Usually it's the other way around. When someone's in jail, right, you have people from the family, people they know, writing them letters saying, listen, dude, you got to do things better now. This is not right. And it's totally switched. The jailbird is writing to this guy. And why should Philemon, the wealthy guy, the powerful guy, right, the well-respected guy in the community, the leader of the church, He's a wealthy slave owner. He's, you know, he's got some resources. He's popular. He's powerful. Why should this guy listen to the dude in jail? This is why. Spiritual authority. Spiritual authority. I don't like the word authority. Let me read to you a definition of authority. Okay? If you want to, you can jot it down if you want. But either way. Here's the definition of authority. The power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. <laughs> or a person or organization having power or control. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't even like reading this, right? I, let, right? Is, there, is there any good feeling coming up out of you as, as, as I'm reading this definition to you? None is none of them are, are good for me, right? I don't like to read it. I, I'm, a, I'm a mouthy kid from up north. I don't like to be told what to do, right? Don't look at me like you're not. I mean, no, who likes to be told what to do? Nobody at all, right? Never. So, so, so here's the, so we're all in this together when it comes to, to authority. But even as the lead pastor in this church, the person who has authority here, I still don't like reading this. Because as I'm reading it, I'm reminded afresh of the enormous weight that's upon me. And as I look into your eyes, I am seeing the weight that's upon me. And I don't like it. See, the authority, like in a bank, or in a company, or in a factory, or at a restaurant, or in a team, as a coach, whatever it is that, and I'm, I, that's a huge responsibility, right? It's all resting on the shoulders of a man or a woman who's at the top of this thing, and I, that's massive, and I'm never going to make light of that. It's, it's absolutely huge. And, and here's the next step, right? If you've ever had the privilege of looking into the eyes of a newborn that's yours and going, oh my goodness, 
I'm responsible for that thing, right? That's crazy, right? Because you all of a sudden went from this kid who's playing with Barbie dolls, and now you have a real one. And this thing doesn't live unless you take care of it. That's enormous responsibility, right? Huge. Well, elders and pastors in the church have a different weight. And it's, <clears throat> it's not monetary, although sometimes, you know, it is, right? This all has to get paid for, right? So that's, that, sometimes it involves that, but that's not the main thing. And it's not about providing housing or, or clothing for someone, although, you know, like a parent, although sometimes that's, I mean, you get those phone calls at the church too, so sometimes it's that, but that's not the main thing. <clears throat> it's not ensuring wins for a team like a coach. It's not ensuring that stockholders are happy with their dividend checks. It's not about writing speeding tickets. That's not it at all. Here's what it is. Go to Hebrews chapter 13. Please go there. Don't, don't just listen to me. Hebrews 13, 17 says this. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow, for that certainly not be for your benefit. Listen, their weight and Paul's weight and my weight is your soul. That brings tears to my eyes. For a kid who barely graduated high school, with all the wreckage in my rearview mirror, to even read that is devastating to me. You have to understand what that feels like. Your soul is who you are. You understand? You understand that that's who you are? That what you see before you, even right now, this is not who Moses is, right? It's not. You, you, it's actually who you are. Are. Here, let me give you some scripture verses to support what I'm talking about because there's a lot of talk about, you know, what are you? Are you a spirit? Are you a soul? Are you this or that? I would just say that you're a soul with a body around it. Ephesians, um, I'm sorry, um, Genesis 2, 7, Old Testament says that when God breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils, he became a living soul. Okay, that's who he is. Now here, New Testament, so you can see it's all the same, one book, one God. Hebrews 10.39, we are not like those who would turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. What, what, when you say yes to Jesus, what's saved? Is it your body? Is it your spirit? No, it's your soul. It's actually who you are. This most precious part of your being that's the part that Jesus actually went to the cross and died for. And that part is what your pastors and elders are responsible for. Your soul. Your soul. And that's heavy. The great apostle Peter, you guys all know who he is, I'm sure. He had something to say about this. Do me a favor and go to 1 Peter chapter 5. <coughs> And look, at, this is what Peter says about this, okay? And, and, and you can see I'm not like, I'm not as crazy tonight as I normally, because this is like not a whole lot of fun to preach, right? So just, just but, but we want to progress, right? You guys want to progress? Listen, the whole purpose behind this is because we want you to be an authentic follower of Christ. And if we, if we withhold this, then you're not. Do you understand? This is not something that anyone wants to hear. This is not anything that anyone wants to preach, but if we're going to worship Jesus in spirit and in what? And in truth, we have to know this. Because if, we're, if he says to do this and you don't do that and it's not good for you, then shame on me. I have to give an account. So I have to preach this. So, but I'm not as excited as I normally would be. It's not super, super exciting. But it's very, very true. We need to know it. So here's Peter. <coughs> <coughs> He says, and now a word to you who are elders in the church. I too am an elder 
Okay, he's about to qualify himself. Why should we listen to this guy, right? Why, why should we listen to him? This is why. I, too, am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, and I, too, will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. Okay, so qualified as a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you, Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your good example. Lord it, but Lord, see, I'm reading that earlier. Actually, didn't, this didn't really strike me until I was in my office just prior to walking out here. Don't lord it over. What do you say? What do you mean? Lord, Lord, what over? There's nothing specific there. Like, what do you mean? Lord, it. What is it? Well, when you see that, you have to look back. He's referring back to the, what he had previously said. Don't lord your caring. Don't lord your position as the, as the caretaker of this flock. Don't lord it over him. And it, it, did you notice that it's not capital L, like the good Lord? who's the good shepherd, who does actually good for you. When, he's, when he speaks and you follow, it's for, your, it's for your good. This is not that. This is bad. Don't lord it over him. Like, you should do this for me because I want to get something out of it. Look what he says. What are you doing it for? Willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it. So, so if you walk into a church and the person is, is hollering, yelling, and telling you to do something so that they can benefit, they're missing the mark. That's not spiritual leadership. Look what it says. Read on, read on. Why, 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 why am I caring for you? Why am I watching over you? Why, why am I doing this? Is it so that I can get something from you? Missing the mark, if that's what it is. Last verse in that paragraph, verse 4. When the great shepherd, who's that? Jesus. When Jesus appears, he's going to tear open the clouds one day, and he's coming. Come on now. Well, come on now. <clears throat> when the great shepherd tears open the clouds and comes, the person who does it well doesn't lord it over, but cares for the flock, watches over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what the people can give him. Ah, look. Then you'll receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. The pastors in the church are doing it for that day. Did you know about that day? The day's coming. Never walk out of here saying, oh, I didn't know about that day. You just heard about it. There's a day coming, right? And so, and, and on that day, that's the day when Jesus will say, hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping he says it to me. I want it to be a good day. I want him to say, hey, good job. That's what I want. I'm not looking to get anything out of you guys. I'm looking to get something from him. I really am not hiding it. I want to, so what, listen, spiritual leaders are, care, are charged to care for your soul, right? Care for your soul. I, I don't know about you. I think it's the most important job on the earth. I, I Think about that. To care for your soul. Is there anything, is there a responsibility that's heavier in all the earth? Just And not to prop up the preacher. Just think about that for a second. Is there anything that's heavier than that. I can't think of one. Anyone who does this outside of a, a clear calling of God is a moron. Think of the responsibility. Your soul, the thing that Jesus went to the cross for, I'm responsible for that. What's heavier than that, guys? Nothing. Nothing. I don't think there's anything heavier in all the world. And listen, listen. <laughs> That's not the heaviest thing. It's not the heaviest thing. I mean, it's super, super heavy, right? Your soul, the thing that's supposed to live forever somewhere. And, we're, and I'm in charge of watching over that and caring for that and, and doing everything I can to try to lead you to that green pasture so that you get there, right? That's huge, but that's not the heaviest thing on top of my shoulders at all. Actually, not even close. Look at verse, uh, verse 2 of chapter 5, 1 Peter. The flock God has entrusted to you. Verse 3, the flock that God has assigned to you. Back in Hebrews 13, their soul is to watch over your souls. They are accountable to God. 
That's the heavy weight. That's the heavy weight. God's the heaviest weight to the leader. And there's a day coming where we will, we will all give an account for our lives. You know that, right? There's a day that's coming, and it's closer today than it was yesterday, and not nearly as close as it will be tomorrow. But there's a day that's coming. You mark my words. There's a day coming where you'll look into the piercing eyes of Jesus Christ and give an account for your life. And I will too, except my day is going to be way different than your day because I have to give an account for yours as well. And you don't have to give an account for mine, but I have to give an account for your life. How did I lead you? What did I teach you? Every single word I've ever spoken from this pulpit or anywhere else into your lives will be on, has been recorded. And he's going to check every single word that I've ever said to you. He's going to check every single action I ever displayed before you. And I must give an account for your life. Your soul is on the line for me. And I have to have that day. You're not going to have that day at all. So speaking up is important, right? I have to say something, and people don't like when I say something. I have people that come in here every single week, and they sit here, and they open up their Bible, and they listen to what I have to say, and the notes come out. But the moment something comes up in their life personally, and I speak into that, gone. Why? Pride. They don't want to listen. The idea of God is awesome. The reality of him bugs you. And you don't like to hear it. And we're around here, we're chapter and verse people, right? We don't go up to, I don't go up to you and give you my opinion. Who cares about Moses' opinion? He, Moses doesn't know his multiplication tables. But Bible, Bible verse, right? I come up with you and I say, hey, listen, the Bible says this. You need to listen. You need to listen. Because a real spiritual leader isn't giving you the verse and the chapter because it's something that will help them gain. No, it's for you. It's for you. And too many times when someone who loves you, who, who's been charged to care for your soul, let me ask you a question. How many people in here offered their soul to me to care for? None of you. God entrusted you to my care. Who's, who has the right to alter that? Raise your hand. That's right. No one. When he puts you in the care of someone, it's not your decision to leave that flock. What happens when a sheep leaves the flock? What does the pastor do? Wham. Listen, that's to show you that when you don't listen to spiritual authority, it's not going to go well for you. And you need to heed this word. Sometimes we need to be more careful in evaluating what we're doing. And sometimes we think we're, oh, this is what God, no, listen. When God's man speaks to you, you listen. That's what it says. This is not about me. I don't care if you're going to another church. When God has entrusted you to a man, you listen and you submit and you obey. Nobody likes to hear this, guys, and I don't like preaching it. This is the kind of message that sends people out the door and says, that son of a gun, who's he to tell me? That's why I don't want to preach this. I want this church to grow, right? I'm not coming after you because this is going to help something. This is not going to help me, guys, right? <laughs> I have a greater chance of losing some of you here tonight than gaining you by preaching this. But if I love you, I'm going to preach it because it's what God's word says. And if you don't do what it says, what does he say? It's not going to be beneficial to you. If you don't obey and submit, it's not going to be good for you. So, I want you to understand that I don't stand up here as this Yoda who knows everything and tells you what you have to do. And you've got to listen. Listen, I have spiritual authority in my life. Some of you guys know Ralph Howe. Like, this is just an example of a guy. Ralph Howe, he's preached here once before. He's from a big old monster church in Orlando. And he was the guy instrumental, one of the guys instrumental in leading me to the Lord. 
and he keeps in touch with me, and I keep in touch with him. As a matter of fact, we text back and forth in my office just before I walked out here. And I reminded him that he was a mighty warrior, a mighty hero, and he, invite, he reminded me of the same thing before I stood up here. But let me tell you something. When Ralph Howe calls me or I call him, there's a whole lot of listening on my end. When he speaks, I shut my face and I listen. And if he says, I think that this is what you should do at the church, the only thing coming out of my mouth is, yes, sir. So when I asked him a while back, what is it that I need to do? I feel like we plateaued. I feel like we plateaued. Where do you think our prayer night came from? Ralph Howe. I think that for the next six months, you should start no programs, except you should gather with your people in the church and pray your guts out. That's what you should do. That's what he said. And that's when Monday night started. I obey my spiritual leaders. He says do it, I do it, without question. And what qualifies him to tell me what to do? Is it because he, you know, he, 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 he's an awesome golfer. He was a, he's a professional golfer. He played in the Masters one time. Way back when, way, way back. But is that what qualifies him? Is it because he's super smart? What qualified Paul? His earthly accomplishments? He's a tent maker, man. Now he's in jail. Highly qualified, man. Highly qualified. What qualifies him as a spiritual leader? God had entrusted people to his care. That's what qualified him. God qualified him. In in the book of Acts, verses 13, I think it is, it said that I I think it was Paul and Barnabas were assigned the task, and they laid hands, and and the Holy Spirit had assigned them to a task. In, in In a proper church of Jesus Christ, God puts in place the people that are in spiritual leadership, right? That's what he does, okay? That's what qualifies him as as a spiritual leader. And so when Ralph tells me something, I don't just, I don't have to like wonder, well, do I agree with this? What makes him qualified to tell me? Maybe he can give me golf lessons, but should he be giving me church lessons, God lessons, Bible lessons, leadership lessons? Yes. Heaven forbid I don't listen to him. Heaven forbid we, you know one of the things that happens in the church? This is just drives me crazy. And I, and I guess I'm just as guilty of it as anybody else because we planted this church and there's already a million churches. I'm thankful that we're in an area where there's not a bunch of churches like right here. So that's really cool. But there's a lot of churches. We start church and, and people are talking about church planting. We've got to plant more churches, plant more churches, plant more churches. We don't need any more churches. We need more effective churches. Okay. We got a million churches. If they were rocking it, we wouldn't need any more. But but here's the thing: with so many churches, when spiritual leaders come up to someone and say, "I pick on you, Bethany. This is what you're doing in life, and this is what the Bible says, and you need to quit it." You know what she does? Not you. I'm just saying. Yeah, well, tough. I'm packing my stuff, and I'm going to go down to the church down the road, and I'm going to walk in, and they're not going to know anything except, hey, here's a lovely young lady with three beautiful kids. Oh, welcome. We love you. And they continue on in the sin that's causing them harm, and they refuse to listen to spiritual leadership, and it goes on and on and on and on, and it's not helpful. And so heaven forbid we just jump ship all the time and go church to church, leader to leader, pastor to pastor, because we don't like what we're hearing. How many people love hearing anything on any page in this Bible? I don't. I don't like any of it. I'm good for you. Come on up and preach. Because I don't like it. Every bit of it goes against my nature, does it? I mean, all of it. That's why it's in there. Nothing's in there to go, hey, you guys are rocking it. Just keep doing what you're doing. How many chapters are, th- are there in the Bible about that? None. Always calling you to more things, higher ground. You're crooked, get straight. All the time, all the time. I want more, I want more, I want more. All the time, but we don't listen. A real Christian obeys spiritual authority. Okay? And so you see here in the book of Phil that Paul spoke boldly about something that was hard to hear and even maybe hard to stomach but it would be best for his flock, it would be best for, um, for, for Philemon, and it's also written to the church, right? You see that in the beginning of the book. It says it was written to 
Philemon and Aphia and Archippus and to the church that meets in your house, Phil. And they're all reading this letter, right? So he's, he's really calling Phil out because now he's putting the pressure on. He's like, hey, I'm, I'll read this to the whole church. And so now it's like, dang, if I don't do this, I'm looking bad. So now the whole church is going to hold their pastor accountable to this high ground, this high watermark of Christianity, and he kind of has to do it. But he's writing it to all the people. This is really, really bold and hard to preach. It's hard to receive, but it would be best for his flock. And listen, the flock, including Phil, they have to obey. They have to submit or else it's bad. Loved ones, this is not easy to preach at all. But again, the reason why we have to preach this, for me to stand up and say, y'all need to listen to me, like that is not easy. I don't think very highly of myself. But it says there in the book that if you love Jesus, it says you're doing it because you're eager to, to, to serve the Lord. That's what the real preacher is doing it for. And, and to do it willingly and grudgingly, not what you could get from them, but you love the people. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over their souls. Like you, so if you, if you love the Lord and you love the people, then you have to preach this message because full disclosure would help create proper disciples. If, if the church is not teaching you this, that you need to obey spiritual leadership and you're all going off and doing what the Bible says all throughout the Old Testament that each person did what pleased them, what seemed good in their own, in their own eyes, then it's chaos and anarchy and crazy. No one's following the Lord. They're just doing whatever they want. And so we have to teach the people this because if you, listen, if you don't submit and you don't obey, it's clear what it says. It would, it would be unprofitable or unbeneficial to you. And so if I love you, I would not want to withhold something from you. And by withholding it from you, I would cause things to go poorly for you. I would want what's best for you. And so I have to teach this stuff. Paul is, Paul is telling Phil to forgive the runaway slave, right? To, to kind of write off any debt he has to you and, and apply it to Paul. Well, Paul hasn't presented a checkbook yet, so he's kind of basically just write it, write it off, forgive the slave, listen to this, consider him unequal. You're the rich, successful, powerful church leader who's rocking it as a Christian, and this slave <coughs> that everyone would look down on, including you, I want you to treat him as equal, not only that, just by, not just by word, and by your mind or your heart, but I want you to now partner with him to advance the gospel, work side by side with this guy who wronged you. That's a high watermark, big time. It's not easy, but it's best, right? And that's why he's coming after Phil. This is not easy, brother. I could tell you you have to do it, but if I can get you to the place where you want to do it, man, God has really done a work inside of you. And that's going to be awesome. And you're going to be even a better Christian for it. So it's not easy, but it's best. And the reason why it's best is because, the, because of the gospel. When you say yes to Jesus, the Bible says you're in a new creation. That the old has died, and behold, there's a new person, Right? And so when you say yes, the reason why he's telling him to do this is because when, 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 when Onesimus said yes to Jesus, he's a new creation. And so old identity marks that used to, okay, he used to be poor. He used to be a slave. He used to be worthless. He used to be really material to a rich person. All those old identity marks, they start to fall off and die, and we see a new person. He's now a son of God, a daughter of God, a disciple of Christ, a co-heir with Christ, a friend of God. He's a saint now. And listen, other Christians, you have to view and treat those people that way. Listen up, no matter how you feel. 
It doesn't matter what you think or feel. God says when this Onesimus, who's, let's just call him a dirty, rotten scoundrel, when he truly gave his life to Christ, he's a new creation. He's not a dirty, rotten scoundrel anymore. You're to treat him as if Paul himself, that's what the Bible says in Philemon, I'm coming back and I'm sending him like myself. I'm sending him with my own heart. I want you to treat that dude who wronged you just as if the great apostle Paul was coming to your house. If, if the apostle Paul was coming to your house, what would you do? Roll out the red carpet, wouldn't you? Guy's awesome. I heard somebody say, a preacher today said, that I don't know about what's going to go on in heaven, but I know when you get there, there's going to be a long line in front of Paul to get his picture with you. What would you do if he was coming to your house? What would rolling out the red carpet look like? You think you'd cook him a nice meal? You think you'd set up the, the bed with maybe some mints on the pillow? Fluff his pillows just a little bit more, make sure the air conditioning's just right? Whatever it is, right? Some celebrity coming to your house and, and Paul's like, yeah, I want you to treat that guy that you hate, who wronged you, who you look down. I want you to treat him as equal, not just with me, Phil. I want you to treat him as an equal with you. That's, that's not easy. But he calls him to this. And this is what God's word says. When someone's in Christ, they're a new creation. Behold the new man, right? Someone new. And this is what God's word says. And so when a spiritual leader is exhorting you in this way and calling you to something higher, then his authority, in that authority, is God's authority, not the man's authority. Do you understand? When, 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 the, when, the, when, the, when the preacher is sharing God's word with someone and saying, this is what God's word says, and, right? Come here, Mike. Come, 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 come. So, so this is what it says, right? Um, and, and here's the guy, and he's, he's up to no good, right? He's, he, you're up to no good? Are you up to no good? No, okay. We're just using this as a prop, right? He would never do bad. He's, he's sinless in every single way. But, but, but if, 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 if this guy was doing wrong, and I come up to him, and I say, hey, uh, I see what you're doing, and, and it's, it's not cool, so chapter and verse, right? Um, who, is, who's authority? Who, is, who's talking to him here? Is, is the preacher talking to him? Who's talking to him? It's the word of who? The word of the Lord, right? The word of the Lord. It's not me. Right? I mean, how much do I mean? Nothing. But what's my words mean? Everything, right? And so what's your job? To listen. Obey. <laughs> obey. Go. Love you. Right? That's what we're supposed to do. You're supposed to obey when the word of God is spoken to you. Listen, I'm just like, I, I hate to demean myself. I'm like Howdy Doody. Remember Howdy Doody with a string, a puppet on the knee? That's me. I have no opinion that matters. I have no authority that means anything except what God has given me. And if I speak to you and I use God's word, it's the word of the Lord coming to you, right? And what do you do to that? Listen and obey. That's what you do. And, and it carries the authority of God himself. James 4, 6 says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, right? And, 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 and what does it mean to be proud? I don't care what you're saying, preacher. This is what I'm doing. This is, this is, <laughs> I love this one. Everything's going smooth in this direction. It's got to be God doing it. Really? I think that there's a nation called Israel that would object to that. I think there was, I think there was millions that stood before the Red Sea and went, this is not going good. Why should we listen to you? God, <laughs> is the river of God always flowing so smoothly? <laughs> no. Most often the river of God is, 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 is difficult and bumpy. Why, if everything that God wants to do is the path that seems so smooth, why would he say that he's calling you into suffering with him? 
I just think of fasting. Why would you want me to fast? If everything's going good, why would you want me to not eat? Doesn't make any sense, right? I think Christians need to slow down. In, in light of, of the church of Jesus Christ being eternal and God is eternal, and when you say yes, you're going to live forever, I think we need to slow down. I think we need to slow down and really super evaluate things that are going on and test them versus the word of the Lord. Not what you hear, but what you read, right? Because hearing isn't always reading. The author of your hearing isn't always the author of what's written. And we need to be careful and slow down before we make decisions that are going to be not beneficial for you. And how many people are seeking godly counsel before they make a big decision? Not many at all. How many people in the church of Jesus Christ are, you know, how many, let me tell you how many, how many appointments I have in my office when the phone rings and someone says, um, Pastor, I have a really big decision to make and I want to sit and talk to you about that. You know how often I get that phone call? Hardly ever. Why? Yeah, see, it says that, that, that um, James 4, 6, God opposes the proud. Listen, when, when, when God's man speaks to you truth from his word and you say no to that and you don't listen, it says it's going to be uh, not beneficial for you, right? Do you know why it's not beneficial for you? Because God is opposing you. I'm not opposing you. I'm nothing. Okay, how would you like to be competing against God? Okay, well, listen, listen, this is, it's like, this is as serious as a heart attack. It's not funny in any way. If, if God's man speaks to you from the word of the Lord and you say no, you have God opposing you. How, how's, is that going to go well for you? Not, not at all. And so, so that's why it says you, you have to listen, right? God, not the man, he, he's nothing, remember this. God has entrusted your soul to a man. It's not his choice. No man would want this unless he's insane. God has entrusted you to the care of spiritual leadership. And their job is to care for your soul, to watch over it, right? Our job is, what's the job of the pastor, really? To lead you like a shepherd to the greenest pasture, to be in the presence of God and be in his will to the best of our ability. That's our job. God entrusted you into the care of spiritual leadership. Real Christians obey spiritual leadership. Now, let's get past that. Now I can breathe, okay? Please receive it with humility. Humility means I don't know everything. God knows everything. He's right about everything. If I'm right about anything, it was a, it was, I'm real lucky about that. Like, if I, could, if I could get right about anything, that would be awesome. But God's right about everything, right? That's humility. Not that you suck. That's bad humility. It's, 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 it's. God is right about everything. That's true humility, okay? And so um, let, let's move on to this. Now, now we, we see that we're supposed to listen to spiritual authority, but now here's what the spiritual authority Paul is speaking into his life, and it's written to the whole church, so spoken into your life right here, right now, okay? All that Paul is calling Phil Philemon. I'm calling him Philemon. I don't care what y'all think. Um, all that Paul is calling uh, Philemon to is wrapped up right there in, in verse 6. Look at, look at verse 6 in Philemon. What does it say? Uh, participation in the faith would be effective. That's what he's asking for. He wants his participation in the faith. That's Holman Christian standard. Participation in the faith may become effective. New Living would say, put into action <coughs> the generosity that comes from your faith, right? Something should happen. Um, you might not think so, but I would tend to, to believe that um, since the father is referred to in the masculine, I think that that's why men 
are very task oriented. That's just my opinion. I'm not drawing this from, so like th that's the Bible over there, right? And this is me. I think that that's why we're so task oriented. Because I believe that God is task oriented. He wants us to participate at a greater level of effectiveness in his kingdom. He wants to see some results in your life. He wants to see what Pastor Jay called fruit. What does that mean? What, is, what does fruit mean? More souls for the king, right? Would that be fruit? More, more, more uh, fruit of the spirit being produced in those who are already in the kingdom? So he wants to see fruit. He wants to, but at the end of the day, what does that mean? He wants to see some results for his investment, right? Jesus went to the cross to pay for your sin and mine, to become sin so that you could become the righteousness of God, but not to be righteous, just like imputed to you so you can go, ha ha, I'm righteous, but continue to sin and be just the same person you were as you were before Jesus. No, he wants to see some results come out of that. He's invested heavily into you. You have bought at a price. You're no longer your own. You have bought with the precious price of Jesus' blood. And he wants to see something from that. He's looking for some fruit in your life. And so Paul's writing to Philemon, who's like rocking the Christianity. He's not some slacker. Philemon is the, he's the pastor of a church. In the, in, and he says here in Philemon, Paul says of him, he says that you have a love for God and you have a love for God's people. He said your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. Like, what, is, what does it mean by kindness? Like, there was obviously some fruit in this guy's life. He's not saying, hey, slacker, get off your fanny and do something for a change. Maybe that's the word for someone tonight. I don't know. But, but, but he's writing to a guy who's rocking the Christianity, right? But he's shown kindness in the past. What does that mean? I don't know. Was he, did, he, did he help financially with people who were in need? Maybe that was it. Maybe he prayed a lot for people. Maybe that was it. Maybe he, was hot, he displayed great hospitality, opened up his home. Maybe that was it. I, I, maybe, he, maybe he just like helped out. Hey, I need help with something. And he just helped, right? I, I, I don't know what it is. He, re, he refreshed their hearts by doing something. And I love that he just leaves it wide open because we can kind of plug a lot of different things in there. But there's times in his life that he had displayed amazing passion for the kingdom of God, and he really worked. And so certainly, like Paul was recognizing in his words that Philemon had definitely participated in the faith, right? He was, he was the pastor of the church. He was get, open up his home, probably have some food laid out, breaking bread, teaching, doing all this stuff. He'd refresh the hearts of many of the believers. But he's calling them to more. He's calling him to more. He's not going after the slacker in the pew that shows up on Sunday morning, gives his little five bucks in the plate, says a few hallelujahs and goes home. No, he's going after the guy boldly who's rocking it for Jesus and saying, I want to bring some conviction to this guy, man. I want to compel this guy to do even more. See, the Bible says that we're to offer, in, in Romans chapter 12, it says that we're supposed to Offer our whole bodies as a living sacrifice. Give yourself as a living sacrifice. What, 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 what is self? Like, isn't that your whole body and your mind, your thought, any resources that you have available to you? And I'm not talking about just cash. But I'm also saying don't just exclude that. All of it, anything that's available to you, give it to the Lord. He says that's your reasonable worship. I'll, I'll settle for 100%, although he's like Paul. Now I know why Paul's like this. I'll settle for 100. I could ask for more, but I'll settle for a 100% commitment. And that's what, that's what Paul's calling this guy to. Maybe he was at 60. Maybe he was at 75%. Maybe he was operating at 85% full potential. That's awesome, right? How many of us can say that? No one. But, but he's calling this guy to even more. Romans 6.13 says, instead... Give yourself completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. It's just another way of saying this, of the great commandment. What is, when, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What did he say? To love the Lord, and this is a command, listen. 
It's a command. It's not, hey, can, can you, I think you should work on this. God's not a God of suggestions. He's a God of commands. And he said, I am telling you to love the Lord God with all your mind. What does that mean? Like every thought. You should be thinking about how beautiful he is. You should be thinking about his word. You should be thinking about ways to advance the kingdom in your family, in your neighborhood, in the church, at work. You should be thinking Bible verses. You should be thinking about the splendor of the Lord Jesus all the time. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, your heart, your emotions, right? That's where your emotions are. You should be just, but like, when you, when you, like, pick on Mike. Listen, I'm, I'm telling you right now, when we're going to sing one more song. Don't look at Mike. Don't look at Mike, please. But I'm going to use him as an example. When he worships God. And you see him, and he doesn't do it for attention. I'm, please forgive me if I'm making you feel uncomfortable. But when he's on his knees back there, and he's weeping, crying and screaming out to Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, every emotion, excitement and thrilled and fear and love pouring out of your heart all the time. Love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul. Your soul, it's who you are. It's the thing that's going to live forever. Have you committed that thing to Jesus Christ? Have you done that? Have you done it? Love the Lord God with all your mind, your heart, your soul, and then your strength. Like everything that you have, are you going after him? Are you pursuing a passionate love affair with Jesus Christ? And, and that's what the Bible says to do. And Paul is, is screaming out to his friend, you're, you're doing a great job, but you, you, not 100% of your mind is his. Not 100% of your heart. You, you, you have areas in your life that are not quite there. You could be doing so much more. You have so much more potential. Do more, do more, do more. You know how many people have left this church because I hammered them with this? Call me selfish. Bless you. Call me selfish, you want this for your own gain. Listen, how, many, how much gain do I get if you do more for the Lord and do more for the Lord and do more for the Lord? How much gain do I get? Is anyone putting any years on my life? Anyone putting any more hair on my head? Anyone, anyone putting more money in my account? No. I'm doing this because this is what the Bible calls for. He said, give, give yourself completely to God. What would a church look like filled with people like that? In, in 1873, there's this British evangelist. His name is Henry Varley. He said this. This is awesome. The world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through and in a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. What would he do? What would God do with you? If you gave yourself completely to him. And that's what Paul is saying to Philemon. Give yourself completely. Don't you want to be that person? I mean, none of us really feel like we can probably get there, but don't you want to be that person? I want to be that person. Like, so badly I want to be that person. But how would I ever get there? How could I? I have seen, like, you look at your own life, you're like, my life is like a million miles from that. Everest, right? Like, there's no way. How would I get there? Well, don't guess. Don't try to figure out. Don't, and listen, it's not even really necessarily all about, like, working harder, although you're going to see that some of it, yeah, it's a little bit about working harder, but look at verse 6. Again, look, look what it says. I am praying that you'll put into action the generosity or participation in the faith would be more effective. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. That's how. 
Let me read the New Living just so you full full look at this. I'm praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. The way to get there, it's all wrapped up in your identity in Christ. And what he's saying here is when you realize who you are now, when you realize whose you are now, when you realize whose spirit is in you that raised Christ from the dead, when you realize the spiritual gifting that God has put inside of you, something should go off inside of your mind that says, something amazing has happened here. Ephesians 1.3 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. 2 Peter 1.3, by his divine power, God has given us everything. Say everything. everything. Everything we need for living a godly life. We have received. Received is past tense. We have received all of this, how? By coming to know him. Now you have to understand that this all happened, at, but at the same time, we're called to know him more, right? So not only were we blessed big time when we came to know him, but as you come to know him more and more, right? You experience more and more of who he is. It's, it's an experience. That's why I love the New Living Translation, this. Not just knowing it, but experiencing this thing. As you get to know him more, and you get to experience his power in your life more, you'll be able to do more. That's what he's saying here. So Philemon, as you get to know him more and more and more, I want you to take that reality of what you have inside. When you understand what God's put inside of you for his glory, you can start to participate in this faith movement at a greater level with more effectiveness than you ever have before. But first you have to understand what's inside of you. What do you mean by that? You guys know about the yoke? Anyone know? You know what I'm talking about, the yoke? You know what a yoke is, right? You heard about the yoke? The yoke's no joke. Listen, the yoke's important. Matthew 11, Jesus says this. He says, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, come to me and I will give you rest for your soul. For my burden is light and my, my yoke is easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Like, how many people feel as though that they have a very heavy burden called their life? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you think your burden is heavy. Come on now, you shy people. You don't think life's tough, right? Everyone is just rocking it. Everything's going smooth, right? Mike's honest. He's got two hands up. Awesome. He's got jobs, bills, relatives, neighbors, big burdens, got kids. That's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot on you, isn't it? How many people think that God's burden is pretty heavy? You think you got a lot going on, right? Yes. How many people think that, it is, that God has a lot on his plate, right? Spinning some planets around and stuff, making sure that none of them smash into us so we don't all perish. That's kind of big. So you admit that his burden is heavy, right? I, I do too. But yet he says, my burden's light. My burden's easy. and My yoke is easy. My burden is light. But his burden is not light. But in light of his power and ability, his burden is very, very little. And we're talking about knowing him and experiencing his power. And when you experience all that God has planted inside of you, you can participate more effectively, right? And so the yoke is this. My burden is light. I, I, I'm, I'm, I am running the universe, and it's nothing to me. It's nothing to me. I'm I'm rocking the universe, yo, and I'm telling you, it's light. It's like not even there. Do you know the Bible says that the known universe are but the fringes of his robe, right? So so he's saying all this, this, this amazing universe that staggers your brain, 
I'm running this thing like nothing. Hook into my yoke. I'll add your little nothing burden that you think is so big into my massive burden that is nothing. Hook into my yoke, and you watch how much easier it is. Life with me. I'll start doing some stuff. You hook into my yoke. We start walking together, and things start to go a little bit different, right? And fruit starts to be, be, be flourishing in your life. And he starts using you for stuff, right? Things start to turn around. You're not falling into the same, same, same stupid habits that you did before. You're not falling back into the cliff. You're not the cat chasing its tail because you're actually doing something that the Bible says you should do. And you join in with Jesus in his yoke, and he starts carrying that load for you. And when you start experiencing all that, and you understand who Jesus is to you and what he's done for you and what he's deposited inside of you for his glory you could start to participate more effectively on his mission. And so what I would say to you is that when you come to church and the truth in God's word is preached over you week after week after week, and as you study God's word on your own and you meditate on it day and night, and the Lord uses that to teach you about this new creation that you are, and you start to realize that, and you start to like buy into it, and start to put your toe into the water a little bit of faith, and trusting him, and attaching to the yoke, and he starts carrying your burdens for you, when you start to experience that, then something should happen. You should therefore start to participate more effectively in evangelizing his world. We keep learning from Christ. We keep experiencing Christ. We keep working for Christ. All these things in increasing measure every week and day and month and year. Always more, always more, always more. Guys. The question is, what does generous, effective participation look like? Because that's what it says. Well, it's kind of like the kindness that Philemon displayed over the years that refreshed the hearts of the people. We don't know exactly what it was, right? And so I don't know exactly what generous, effective participation looks like for you in your life. But you just heard the word of the Lord. So now you need to figure that out. Like you need to spend some time with him and figure all that out. Maybe generous, effective participation for you personally, maybe it means committing to getting to know him more. Maybe your, your, your pursuit of the Lord hasn't been with your, all your strength. Maybe you just half heart this thing and you'll learn a little bit as you go. I would say this, don't let what I learn every week be all that you learn every week. Perhaps generous, effective participation for you is to hook into his yoke. Maybe for the first time, and you look up into the yoke and start letting him share your burdens and help you. I don't know what that looks like for you. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take communion now. If I get gentlemen to come up, we're going to hand out communion. And I want you to hold on to that thing as the elements come to you. I want you to hold on to it, and I want you to be thinking about that. You know, the Bible says when we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. So during, other than when you get the communion elements, I want you to just like keep your head down, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, and ask him what generous effective participation looks like for you okay so let's take a few moments and think on those things and then I'm going to come back up and, and I'm going to lead you in taking the communion together as a family
with our eyes fixed on you, Lord, not only would we turn our eyes to you, but we would turn our ears to you to hear what's the specific thing that you need me to know. Before I take this communion, Lord, before any of us take this to our lips, we want to work out our relationship with you here right now because maybe it's not as rocking as it should be. Maybe it's that I haven't listened to spiritual authority. Maybe I would just go my own way. Maybe we're all prone to be like the days of old when each of us did what was right in our own eyes. Instead of realizing that you, Lord, have placed us under the care of godly men of your choosing. Perhaps it's for this godly man where I need to get to know you better, Lord, to up my credibility before your people. Feel a strong sense of that for me. Maybe I need to sit at your feet, Jesus, and learn all that I am in you now, all that you've deposited into me when I said yes. So maybe there's a little repenting that needs to be done. Lord, we don't want to treat the gospel as common. So as we get ready to take these two elements that are so precious and important, remind us afresh that the gospel is not common. And your word is not common. And it's not something to be played with, but that we should shudder at your word. still in us a fresh understanding of this. Lord, sometimes we don't do what you want us to do because we don't understand what you've done. <laughs> so as we take this communion, Lord, let it be a reminder to us of who you are, what you've done for us on the cross at Calvary, and remind us of our proper response and what that should look like. So Lord, now we take this bread as a reminder of your amazing sacrifice on the cross, laying down your body for us. Take it in remembrance of me. cup, a reminder of your never-ending commitment to us, your new covenant to last forever, signed with the blood of Jesus himself. We take this cup to remember this. Praise you. We come to our feet loved ones and I would just say in light of the cross in light of what you just did and what you just experienced and what you've just heard there is a praise that is appropriate for this Jesus so let us join together with one voice to praise his name. 